In this section, we're going to talk a little bit about legal concerns because, like it or not, the legal realm that we live in or the re legal society we live in does have to... Um, does have to do with some of the things that the church does. And we want to make sure that we're being good, law-abiding citizens. Which is really, I want to talk about, well, before I say anything more, I'm going to say this. A bit of a disclaimer. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not trained in law or licensed for law. So what you're getting is my opinion. And so don't take it for a legal opinion. But I'm going to give you some of the things that I understand. And having said that, I, I think that there's an attitude towards law that we would like to make sure that everyone adopts because there is an attitude to law where get away with what you can, right? I was in a church one time and during our testimony time, a lady stood up and she said, we had a drive that was meant to be eight hours last night, but we drove like 50 kilometers over the speed limit and we made it all the way home and we didn't get caught by the cops once. And this was her testimony on Sunday morning. And so I was like, eh. I mean, I'm glad you survived. I'm thankful for that. But the thank, being thankful that you broke the law um, all the way along the way uh, is not something that we're thankful for. So there's a scripture I'd like to read just to kind of center us on what our attitude towards the law should be. It's in Romans chapter 13, where it says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against God what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. So there's a couple of reasons there that we're given that we should have a good attitude, a um, compliant attitude towards the law, and one of them is it's really indirect obedience to God. Unless the law is telling you to do something that's in direct disobedience to one of God's commands, then we see what's coming through the government as, and the legal system as being something that God wants us to adhere to. There's a, that indirect kind of a submission and, and obedience to God through there. But there's also the avoiding of the penalties of law-breaking. You know, if you're driving along 50 kilometers over the speed limit or if you're doing things in your administration that are just wrong, there's always that little bit of fear that, hey, you're going to get caught and you're on your, on your toes for that. And sure enough, if you keep doing those kind of things, you probably will get caught and then you're going to have to pay some kind of penalties. So you can avoid the penalties, avoid the fear, if you just be careful to obey the laws of the land. There's also an element of this where our testimony to the community is reflected by how we treat our civil laws and um, we want to be good citizens, really, and be a testimony to our community of being good citizens. And just one more little comment before I go on to some more specifics about the whole legal environment and legal concerns. In Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says that we should pray for those who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives and all godliness and holiness. There's a, there's a purpose, a general purpose, that we have laws in the land, and that's so that everybody can get along well, that we don't live in the midst of this chaos and, and harmful situations. So by being law-abiding citizens, we're also supporting the purpose of law, which is that we can live peaceful and quiet lives. So enough said about that. Have a good attitude about law. Now, <clears throat> there are specific laws that pertain to operating a church. Um, one of them has to do with our hiring policies. So we need to be careful that we, uh, we know and we adhere to whatever hiring policies are in place in our provinces. And if we don't, we can get ourselves in trouble one way or another. I, I actually am supportive of, you know, if you're hiring staff at your church, a janitor, secretary, or whoever you're, you're hiring, that having some sort of a, a position description could be helpful just in, in laying things out clearly, what expectations are. But there are situations where people can get themselves into trouble. Here's a, a hypothetical. Say you want to hire a youth pastor, and it's just a handshake hire. Okay, yeah, you're great. You know, we'll pay you this much. 
I'm going to pay you, you know, you're going to be bivocational, but we're still going to pay you a couple thousand a month. And you shake their hand. After three years, you're not getting along with this youth pastor. And so the, you just decide you're going to fire the guy. You know, it's not working. Sorry, you're done. Now, the problem is there's no real expectations that have late, been laid out with this person. And, and you can run into all kinds of problems. And if you end up in a, a legal dispute with them, you don't have anything in place governing what your relationship is. You're really going to be moving into an area of law called common law. And in common law, um, there's a lot of penalties that tend to go against the employer more than the employee. So the lesson in that is don't do handshake hires. Make sure that you do things properly up front. Make sure that you're treating your employees according to the laws of the land and you're not going to get yourself so much in trouble. Now, there's people that are afraid of, well, who am I allowed to hire and what, what stipulations am I enabled what am I able to put on them? Like, can I say that someone's got to be a Christian, that they live a certain lifestyle? Um, like a situation, you know, can I refuse to hire a secretary because she's living in a common law relationship? She's not married. She applies. She's got experience. She's got other qualifications. Can I say I don't want to hire her because she's not living in a, a proper married relationship? Is this Okay. The answer is yes. <laughs> as long you're allowed to create a Christian environment through your requirements, as long as you apply it consistently. So there has been places that have got in trouble because they rightfully put some stipulations in, but in some of their experiences, they hired somebody else in the same situation and just kind of let it go. If you're inconsistent, then you're going to get yourself into trouble. So there's also copyright laws that we need to live inside of. And, you know, the, the words that we project on our screens, the music that we use or project through our Facebook page, there's all kinds of things like that we need to be aware of. Uh, there's one church that I knew of that they decide they're going to do an outreach to the community. So they decided to stream movies in their church, you know, provide popcorn and seating, just kind of an environment, invite the neighborhood to come in and thought, great way to get people into the church, great way to kind of reach out to our community. But they were doing something wrong. And what they were doing wrong is the movies they were showing were licensed for private viewing, not for public viewing. And somehow, copyright people became aware of what they were doing and they got a cease and desist order that they had to stop what they were doing or they're going to have to pay big penalties or fines. We need to be aware that there are these copyright regulations out there that we need to be adhering to. There's also some uh, religious freedom and freedom of expression laws that, that pastors worry about sometimes, especially as we get put out on Facebook and, you know, there's people that could hear our messages that we aren't necessarily just in a room with. They could be anywhere out there, could be anyone. There's one pastor, he's afraid of speaking about the Bible's teaching on homosexuality, which... I mean, the Bible condemns homosexuality, but was afraid to do that because was afraid that they'd be breaking some kind of a law. But is this wrong? Is it illegal? There is a freedom of religion where you can have free speech as long as you're not inciting hate or violence. There is one situation in Canada I'm aware of where someone was speaking against homosexuality. The way that they were doing it was inciting hate and violence, and so they got charged with that. But in general terms, being the loving and compassionate people that we are, we can freely speak about what the Bible teaches without any fear of legal repercussions. We also need to be aware there could be some social repercussions, which the law doesn't cover. Um, it also has to do the whole religious freedom, you know, sticking to the same topic of homosexuality. What if a homosexual couple wants to be married in your church. Do you have the freedom to say no to them? And the answer is yes, you do have the freedom to say no to them. But it's best if you're clear on what policies that you have. And in Foursquare, our administrative manual gives marriage policies that make it clear about how you're allowed to perform marriages with the license that you have through the Foursquare Gospel Church of Canada. 
But once again, it has to be done consistently. As soon as it's not done consistently, then it becomes legally challengeable. So it's important that we all uphold these policies and standards for the protection of the whole Foursquare family across Canada. Other laws that we encounter are charitable purpose laws because our churches are registered charities. And as a registered charity, there are re um, requirements about how you receive money, how you use money, and even how you raise money. So a church decides to add a building. They've got a big property. They've got an income problem. So one of the, the council members say, hey, why don't we build like a little mini storage locker building on the church and we'll rent it out and we'll raise some money through that. Is that okay? It actually doesn't fit beneath the charitable purpose laws because you're allowed to use your excess space and capacity in order to rent out. You know, you could have somebody come and use your building for other things. But to create a business that is solely for that purpose, you're now going outside your charitable purpose in doing that and you put your charitable status in jeopardy. So these are the th kind of things you need to be considering. Um, if you're renting out your building to different groups, it shouldn't be displacing the ministries of the church to do that. You should still be able to carry on your charitable purposes. And it's best to have groups that align with your charitable purposes. There's also a responsibility, a legal responsibility we have to protect people on church property, even when it's rental property, and in our church ministries. I'd referred to earlier the Child Youth Protection Manual. So, so protecting people on church properties and in church ministries, just think about different scenarios. So you're a church, you've got a low budget, you've got an old building, but your youth pastor happens to be a handyman. And so the pastor says, well, we've got some electrical problems in that area of the basement. Can you have a look at it and see what you can do? And so the youth pastor goes and starts to play around with the wiring and gets a severe shock. Do you think there's any legal problem with what happened there? I mean, the legal problem is you're asking someone to do work that requires a certified technician, and they don't have the certification for that. So there's an employee problem with what you've done there. Uh, or think of this. There's, there's some kind of a, a parent's car breaks down. Okay. You're, you've got an evening program where people have to pick up their kids from the church and the parents phone and say, hey, our car broke down, we can't pick up our daughter, is there any way that you can help? Well, one of the people volunteering in the group, they're fairly new to the church, but they're there volunteering and they say, oh, I'll, I'll give her a ride home. Um, they haven't been screened for vulnerable sector screening, haven't been fully vetted, but they're just assisting, so someone decided that it would be okay for them to be there. Is there a problem with this situation? And the problem is that you're putting that girl into a vulnerable situation and you have a responsibility for care over her. So part of the legal requirement and legal expectation that we would protect people on our church properties and in our church ministries. So here's an unusual one. A church has a large tree that's growing up beside their church building. So a boy climbs up the tree gets on to the roof of the church, and then falls off and breaks his arm. Do you think there's any liability for the church in that? Well, part of our protection is any foreseeable harm that someone could be under. You know, is it foreseeable that someone could do something or, or come to harm by the way that we're doing something? And this is a, a real case. It actually isn't a church. It's a school. But the ruling was that it should have been foreseeable that a child would climb that tree and go on the roof. And so there was a legal responsibility to remove that tree because the harm was foreseeable. So you have to look at your property and your ministries that way. Is there foreseeable harm that we can protect people from? Property purchases and leases are a very common thing in where we need legal advice and legal help. Uh, with church rentals or leases, if a church can get out of a contract with less than three months' notice, they don't have to run it through national board and legal approval. But anything beyond that, we don't want to be locked into these long-term contracts. So those kind of things do have to go through the national board. And we usually send them to our, our lawyer to look through just to make sure that we know what we're getting into. 
Another area people have struggles with sometimes in the handling of money is designated offerings. So there's a, a lady starts coming to your church and she decides that she's going to designate $5,000 in an offering to your church in order to buy a pipe organ for the church because she comes from the good old days and, you know, a church isn't a church without a pipe organ. And you see a check for $5,000. Okay, let's, let's receive that check and issue her receipt. Now, are you locked into buying a pipe organ for your church? The answer is kind of yes. Unless there's been other stipulations been put on, you shouldn't receive that designated money in the first place if you're not going to use it for its intended purpose. It's very difficult to change the intended purpose for any designated offering. And some people say, well, just give it back. You know, once the church has received it and deposit, you can just give the money back. That's not so easy either. Once it's been received and deposited, it's now into the charitable realm, and you can't, it makes it very difficult to even give it back. So you have to be really careful with what you receive. And we usually advise our churches, not usually, we advise our churches that when there's designated offerings, that you have some kind of a, a condition that if it's not able to be used for this designated purpose, then you permit it being redesignated for another purpose. And by people signing off on that, then you're able to, to use it for something else. So it, you've got to be really careful in how you use designated offerings. Um, giving money to people, too. There's laws that regulate what we're able to do. Uh, there's one church where they had an elder who'd served really well, and someone from the church saw that and just said, wow, I mean, they're almost they've almost been like a pastor in the church and after all these years we need to do something to really honor them and bless them and so they put five thousand dollars into the church and said I want this to go to that elder as an appreciation for what they've done now is there anything wrong with that well there is because the elder is not your employee if that money came and was used as salary towards a, a salaried employee that could you know that could all be worked out but you can't just decide that you want to give money to somebody, putting it through the church, getting a charitable receipt. Um, and once it's been received again, it becomes a very sticky process of undoing what's taken place there. So it had a good heart. I mean, you can give $5,000 to the elder. You just can't do it by putting it through the church to give to them. Sending money overseas is another thing. People think, well, I want to support this ministry in whatever country. Let's just send that money off. But CRA has uh, really cracked down on that type of giving. Partially, I understand it, because there's been all kinds of abuse that's gone on. And, you know, somebody just, they send money to their relative in another country, and, and then they issue tax receipts. And so there's a tax break on this side of the, the ocean. And on the other side of the ocean, there's people receiving money from Canada. And so there's all kinds of corrupt things that have gone on. And the government cracks down. And now there's a lot of regulations on what happens and how you send money outside of the country. And so if you're planning on doing something like that, probably instead of trying to explain everything here, I would say talk to the national office first and we'll give you some instructions how that could be set up so that you could do that in the right way and not get yourselves and possibly us in trouble. Other laws that are coming up more and more are privacy laws, even who you send emails to and add your add on to your email lists, how you use the contact details from the church. You know, I've had people phone up and say, oh, can I have the contact details of your members? You know, we want to give them some kind of opportunity. Well, there's privacy laws about who you can share personal information with, that we need to be aware of those kind of things. So without going through all of the, the possible legal scenarios, hopefully I've at least made it um, made you aware that there are some of these things that we need to be aware of as we're leading churches, that there are, there's a legal environment in Canada that we're living within that we need to be aware of and comply with. But it goes beyond that. What if something does happen? What if there's a legal issue that, that comes up? First of all, if it's a routine matter, you go to your first point of um, information, which would be, the administrative manual. And I explained you can go on to foursquare.ca and there it's searchable and you can search your issue. And the latest information that we have, the latest advice that we have is within that manual. And so that would be very helpful to you. 
If it's another type of a routine matter that you just don't understand and you can't find information in the administrative manual about, then you can contact the national office and we'll, we'll do our best to advise you or find the answers that you need in order to deal with this routine legal matter. But if it's serious, like if something happens, if there's a, something that brings high liability, if someone, you know, you discover that abuse has taken place within a church ministry or, or there's something that's happened on church property, someone's been injured or something that could be a high liability for the church, then the first call should actually be to the Foursquare president. Um, because we've had to deal with a lot of these type of issues, we kind of know a process to follow through. The second call is going to end up being to a lawyer because we want to know what our legal rights are. And just saying that, when something serious happens, until you make those first phone calls, don't say much. You know, some people are all apologetic and, well, it's all my fault. And, and as soon as you start to talk in legal terms like fault and blame and it might turn out it's not your fault, but you just admitted legal liability for whatever's happened on this property, and, and that might not be the case, but you just you might have created a situation that you didn't intend to create. So it's best just not to say much, get some advice first, and then move forward from there. When there has been something that's a possible liability issue, maybe there's been an accident or even something with an employee has taken place, it's also wise to contact the insurance company. The insurance companies always want heads up about these things, and if you don't notify them and something does progress further down the road, it's possible that you could be denied insurance coverage by not notifying them of this event. So it's always best to keep them informed. So if there's like a third phone call that you make when something serious happens, it should be to the insurance company. When serious things take place amongst believers, and sometimes they do, there's legal disputes or business disputes within people that go to the same church or even within the church, there's you know, the possibility of lawsuits. We should always do what we can to settle things out of court, even if it takes a, some type of mediation. And there are different opportunities for that. Sometimes pastors or groups of pastors will act as mediators in legal disputes a couple of years ago, we had one of those with one of our churches that um, they, both parties were both willing to have a mediator. The mediator came in and helped settle the dispute between the two people. When that doesn't work, there's also Christian mediators out there at large that you can hire and will help mediate in a dispute. And all of this is, is part of what, you know, 1 Corinthians, um, Paul saying not to bring your your lawsuits before unbelievers. Don't you have enough wisdom within your own church to be able to deal with some of these things? Why put the name of the Lord into disrepute by putting these out into the public realm? So wherever possible, see if you can resolve it out of court when it's something between Christians. One more thing that I'll talk about in the terms of law is it's not just a matter of being aware of what the legal issues might be, or even knowing how to respond to a legal issue that comes up. But there's also a, a wisdom in minimizing your legal risks. One of the ways you do that is consistently follow the policies and procedures that we've learned over the years that have been enshrined in, you guessed it, the administrative manual. So where it says that we should do something or, or follow certain procedures or that you shouldn't do something, there's usually a history behind that that we've either learned through the school of hard knocks or just learned through better information. Another thing that, that you should do is ensure that adequate insurance is in place. Um, for whatever situation that you're in, whether it's rental or purchase or vehicles or whatever it happens to do, make sure that you're properly insured. The really big number cases don't come along very often, but if they do, they have the potential to be devastating. And so we want to protect ourselves against any devastating kind of loss by being properly insured. And by following the policies and procedures, we won't be... Um, that, in, that insurance will actually be active rather than us disqualifying ourselves from it. The other thing, just to 
a piece of advice there is have a lawyer review any complex contracts that you go into. Don't sign something that is complex, especially costly, without knowing what's inside of there. Make, you know, a lawyer is good eyes, and we've got good legal representation through the national office. We may be able to help you depending on what the situation is. But have a lawyer have a look at that contract before you sign on the dotted line. So the whole bringing up of the legal topics is not to create fears. It's not to make you feel insecure. But it's just to make you aware. Be aware that we live in a legal environment in Canada and that there are laws that pertain to the operating of a church. And by obeying the right laws, we are not going to put ourselves or our church in harm's way.